piece of the technology works. Can you all hear me? government grow, what happens when it grows, what consequences does it have, how is it connected with other aspects of social, economic, and political development. And uh, this is in a way an academic subject. It, it, it became in the late 1970s and 1980s a standard subject for economists and political scientists to study. Uh, write articles and books about, and that's when I got involved in it uh, seriously. Uh, but it's not just an academic matter. It's also a very uh, serious practical matter uh, for all of us. Uh, you may have never given any thought to this. You may have no interest in it at all. Sense of an academic subject or something you'd like to read a book about. But I guarantee you that it, it affects you. And it's going to affect you even more in the future. Because uh, the growth of government is a kind of process that cannot go on forever. And, and, and as we say, what can happen won't happen. So <laughs> because it can't go on forever, it's going to stop. And when it stops, there are going to be very serious consequences. Uh, a mass is going to be created. Now, this, this is not something that that I am privy to that no one else realizes. In fact, quite a lot of people understand that the growth of government is actually a very serious economic and political problem in our country and in other countries. And if you follow, for example, what uh, people talk about in Congress, you'll hear sometimes discussions of this matter, and you'll hear uh, debates about it. You'll hear people making proposals about how to slow the growth of government or even occasionally to, to reduce government to a smaller size than it has now. But if you are really careful about what's being said, you'll find that, that it's in, in the nature of people discussing the fact that a that 500 ton boulder is about to fall on them. And what they're debating is whether they should chip away three ounces or four ounces from the boulder before it falls. In other words, the political attention being devoted to the growth of government is at best wholly disproportionate to the importance of the threats posed by the growth of government. Uh, and uh, at worst, it's just a total disregard of the, of the menace that is posed by the continued growth of the government. Uh, particularly people in Congress continue to act as they've acted for a century or more, as if it really doesn't exist. We may give a speech about it every once in a while, but our actions show that we don't take it seriously. This is something where, as the saying goes, we can kick the can down the road another year. We can make government bigger in ways that help us get reelected in the next election, which is always coming up if you're a member of the House of Representatives. <laughs> and even if you're a senator, it's not that far down the road, so you're aiming to get reelected, and you've learned that the way to get reelected is to make government bigger. Uh, 
by giving more benefits to people, uh, by creating privileges for people through use of the power of government. And this has worked for over a century as a steady process, but as I said a minute ago, it won't work for it. There will come a time when the enlargement of government uh, will either prove to be impossible because, for example, no one will buy the government's bonds when it tries to uh, issue new ones to cover its expenses, uh, or for other reasons, people will stop complying with the government's regulations and laws. Uh, at all events, it will stop. It can stop in the way that communism stopped in the old Soviet orbit, for example, which was really very messy. It could have been worse if a lot of people had got killed. But as it was, it was a, it was a very messy uh, transition from the old communist planning system to uh, something uh, more oriented to free markets. Not very free, of course, because none of those countries turned into anything like a totally free market, but they certainly moved significantly in that direction. They gave up the pretense of central planning. So, uh, in the course of doing that, it took some of them years and years and years. Uh, very serious disruptions to many people's lives. It can, it can be messier than that. And if, if the situation is pushed far enough, far enough, it will be very bad. So let, let me now go back and say, how did we get into this dire situation? I believe it's dire. Uh, and the answer is, there's no simple, single answer. It, it's a process that took a long, long time. Uh, it started in a way uh, over a century ago. We can follow the history, trace out the logic of what happened, why people acted as they did, and identify, as it were, who's to blame, which is a multitude of people. There's no one or no handful of villains here. In fact, in some senses, there are no villains. It's possible to suppose that practically everybody involved in this process was acting with good will at the end of what they thought was the public interest. I, I, I think that's a little too generous to some of the important actors. I think they were mainly acting in their own interests, but nonetheless, if you like, you can go ahead and put that, that description on their actions, and then you won't be too much uh, worse off as a result of your understanding of what happened and why. Uh, there, there are, first of all, many ways to measure the size of the government. So when we say government's got big, what do we mean? Uh, we could mean, for example, uh, that government now spends more money than it used to. That's a, probably the most common way that economists and political scientists measure the size of government, by the size of the budget. And of course, there are all kinds of budgets and uh, different measures of how much money is being spent. Uh, so we could get into a lot of details there we were serious researchers, but let's not worry about that tonight. Let's just take uh, standard measures of government spending. And if we went back to the beginning of the 20th century, we would find that all the governments in the United States, state, local, and federal, added up, spent an amount of money that was equal to about 7% of the gross domestic product. About seven. And that share, or government share of GDP, had not grown very much uh, for a long time. It's slightly lower, but you see, if you've only got up to 7%, you can't, you can't have grown all that much because the government at that time was over 100 years old. So it wasn't zero when it started. It took a century just to make it up to 7% relative to GDP. It couldn't have been growing very fast. We don't have really good measures of this kind of data going far back into the 19th century. There are estimates, but they're not as good as the data for the 20th century. But at all events, we know that historically, the government in this country didn't grow very fast uh, until the late 19th, early 20th century, and even then, not going very fast by later standards. If 
then it starts to grow quicker in the 20th century, and especially it grows quicker uh, after 1929 when the Great Depression began. Uh, so the, the trend line of growth tilts up, and, and we, if we look what it happened, we see that, that, that there's a specific pattern to the way it grows. It didn't just start out at 7% in 1900 and just smoothly kind of rise to a higher level until it got up to the current level, which is the, which is in excess of 40% government spending at all levels. More than 40% of gross domestic product now, starting a century ago, 7%. Didn't get there smoothly, it got there erratically. And uh, if I could have shown you my, uh, my chart that I wanted to show you, you would see that uh, there are some real spikes along the way. And uh, the big ones uh, occurred during the World Wars. Uh, when the United States became involved as a belligerent in World War I, which didn't occur until the spring of 1917, government suddenly began to spend enormously more money than it had before. At that time, the federal government's spending relative to GDP was, was only about 3%. And uh, as a result of the big jump during 1917, 18, and 19, uh, the government pushed the total share of government spending uh, up over 25%. The bulk of that was for war purposes. And a great deal of it, in fact, was spent after the war was over. Because once you crank up the bureaucracy and the spending machine and you make contracts with people to produce things for you to buy, you can't just stop suddenly. So as it turned out, the biggest spending year for the US in World War I was fiscal year 1919, almost all of which was after the armistice in Europe in November 1918. There was a big spike there, but it didn't last. After 1919, government spending dropped precipitously, almost as far as it had jumped up before. Uh, and then it settled down into a much lower level than during the war, but a higher level than before the war. And that's a pattern we'll see every time there's a big crisis, whether it's a war, whether it's a big depression, whatever it is, the great national in the 20th century caused the government to suddenly get much bigger, not just the spending either, I'll come back to that. Uh, but in, in other respects, it retrenches at the end of the crisis, but not all the way back to its pre-crisis level. And I refer to that pattern of incomplete retrenchment as the ratchet effect. And uh, a lot of my work has been aimed at showing why that pattern exists. Why does it take that particular form? Now, if you think about it a little bit, you can see right away that if every time there's a national emergency, there's a ratchet in the size of the government, then eventually you're going to get to a very big government because you, you, you never fall back to any point you reach before a crisis. So each time, it's as if you're moving along a trend line crisis occurs, you, you leap up to a much bigger government, and then when you fall back after the crisis, you resume your normal growth of government from a higher level. The trajectory gets displaced. So that eventually makes the government bigger and bigger and bigger. It's as if the, the original trend line then created a new one for the whole 20th century would have a bigger slope. When we get to uh, the Great Depression, there's another leap in the size of government in the early 1930s. And it's interesting that the biggest leap here in the government size relative to GDP did not occur under Roosevelt, but under Hoover. And if you take a history course in school, you were probably told that Hitler was a, uh, that, uh, <laughs> that part, that Hoover was a, uh, a do-nothing president. That's the way it's come down to us. So he, uh, he folded his arms and watched uh, the U.S. economy go to hell and would intervene to, to prevent it. And that is one of the biggest myths in all of the U.S. political and economic history. Because, in fact, uh, Herbert Hoover was a progressive. Uh, he, he, he 
ever hid the fact he was a progressive. He always purported to be a progressive his whole career. Even when he was an old man, he, he wrote a book uh, uh, celebrating Woodrow Wilson, a progressive hero. Uh, and uh, in 1929, and later during the Great Collapse of, of those four years when the economy was, was uh, shrinking every year by a substantial amount, Hoover did a number of things unprecedented to try to fend off the depression and turn the economy around. As it turned out, virtually every action he took made the depression worse. So sometimes people like good intentions are important, but good intentions are worthless if you don't know what the hell you're doing. Hoover thought he knew what he was doing, but he didn't. He was a smart guy. He wasn't like some of the stupid presidents we've had recently. He was an engineer, a very successful businessman. He had made a wonderful career for himself. Uh, he was a very accomplished individual. But he thought he understood how the economy works, and he thought he understood how actions could be taken by government to alter the economy's course. And in that, he was completely mistaken. So even smart guys can make terrible mistakes, and that's one of the problems we see in government all the time. Government's full of clever people. You know, they're graduates of Harvard, and Yale, and Princeton are dime a dozen federal bureaucracies. But that doesn't mean they know what the hell they're doing. And very often they don't. Very often they went to those schools and learned the wrong things, and then put them into practice. Here's our, our example, you know, A, for a court, court case against Herbert Hoover. He made the uh, depression much worse by his actions, particularly by his actions in attempting to get employers to hold up wages instead of allowing wages to fall as they had always done in the past during the economic depression. And because so many big employers went along with Hoover's plea to not cut wages, the result was that the increase in unemployment was much greater and quicker than it otherwise would have been. Think about that. If you're in a business and the demand for your output is falling, okay, what can you do? You're going to lose money, right? If, you, if you're not able to cover your costs, so you can. You can try to cut your costs in one way by paying your workers less. And maybe you can keep going without losing money or losing less that way. But if you can't do it that way, all you can do is reduce how much you're producing. Because every unit you're selling is at a loss. So you reduce how much you're producing, and to produce less, you don't need as many workers. So you fire people, you lay off people. So uh, unable to reduce wages because of the president's pressure not to do so, many big employers, particularly manufacturing, which is a much bigger sector of the economy in those days than it is now, they just fired people. And so if you went to industrial towns all over the Northeast, particularly, you go to a city like Akron or Youngstown or textile towns in Massachusetts, you see unemployment rates in 1933, 40, 50, 60%. Because they hadn't cut wages quick enough. They fired people instead. And Hoover's to blame for that. That was entirely his initiative. But that was only one of the things he did wrong. It makes a good example. It was an especially egregious mistake. Okay. Well, Hoover makes government bigger. Roosevelt's elected in 1932. The New Deal begins when he takes office in 33. He's like an order of magnitude of jump from what Hoover did. Now all hell breaks loose. Congress passed more big, important legislation to regulate the economy in 1933 than any other year in all of American history. And some of it was almost unbelievable what they were trying to do. The National Industrial Recovery Act, which was probably the single big act of the early New Deal, was an attempt to take every industry in the country, other than agriculture and a few services, and, and form a cartel in each one of them. 
Get all firms together, get them into an agreement, which would have the effect of suppressing competition among them, so that they would be able to reduce the amount they sold and get a higher price for their product. This was done in a variety of ways, and I won't try to go through them all tonight, but however it was done in a particular industry, that was the idea. If you can somehow get people to form an agreement that they're all going to cut back, then the whole industry supply brought to market will be less, and other things being equal, when supply falls, the market price rises. And that's what they thought was the problem at the time. We're not making any money in this industry because prices are too low. <laughs> and indeed, they weren't making money. If you take the years 1931, 2, 3, 4, four years in a row, and add up the profits of all corporations in the United States, every one of those years, the net profit of all American corporations was negative. You can find a firm here and there that was managing to make some positive profit, but altogether, the losses offset the profits, so that the net profit was negative for four years straight. Think about that. Nothing like that ever happened before or since. This is a very desperate time. So people thought desperate times call for desperate measures. And they tried things not knowing what they were doing. I'm going to emphasize that over and over because this is a problem that persists to the present day. Right? Long things have been done just in the last few years of contributing both to the increase in the size of government and to the destruction of the American economy. Because people do not know what they're doing. Roosevelt had a brains trust, it was called, a group of advisors when he was running in 1932. Hey, these guys are all professors from Columbia University. That was a big Ivy League deal. Uh, they're supposed to be smart guys. And they advised him about all kinds of policy matters, uh, both before he was elected and afterward, when he was first starting to formulate what his administration would try to do. And the press made a big deal out of this brains trust. That was kind of a new thing in American politics for a politician to get a bunch of academic experts to advise them. So people were impressed with that. Well, college graduates weren't so common in those days as they are now, much less professors. But these experts, these brains trust guys, didn't know what they were doing. They seemed like experts. But in fact, very few people at the time knew what to do. Even very good economists that should have known better started coming forth with bad ideas and bad proposals because they were, they were thrown for a loop by the situation. Just in the same way that recently, when the financial panic of 2008 took place, and the economy began to sink rapidly, the bulk of the economics profession was thrown for a loop. They said, why is this happening? They didn't understand it. Because they were teaching courses in macroeconomics that didn't even have a financial sector. <laughs> Think of that. Your standard macro model didn't have a financial sector. And yet here we got a financial panic, huge financial institutions failing, dragging down people right and left, and you're your economic experts don't have a clue. They've never studied this kind of thing. <laughs> That's the nature of the expert thing. A lot of experts live sealed off from the world. They talk to one another. They impress one another with their techniques of analysis. Even though their models may be wholly otherworldly, they may not have any good connection with reality. They can still have fun playing with them, and they can make nice careers for themselves in the process. Okay, the New Deal comes along in a whole variety of ways, increases the power and scope of government. Lots of economic controls are imposed where there never been any before, especially at the federal level. And then that's hardly e even settled down 
when World War II comes along. And at that point, we have the biggest spike of all in the growth of government. Uh, government spending at all levels uh, jumped up to almost 50% of GDP during the peak of World War II. About half of all the spending. And over 90% of that is federal government spending, almost all of which is for war purposes. There's a reason why World War II is called the big one. It was a gigantic undertaking. 12 million men were drafted into the armed forces when, at the beginning of the war, the entire civilian labor force had been about 54 million people. Think of it. If you did that today, to have something equivalent, you would have to draft about 30 million people. Imagine, look around you, imagine drafting 30 million men in today's population. I can't even relate to that. But that's what they did during World War II. They built up armed forces, 12 million men and, and some women as well. Not overwhelmingly men, but there were some women as well. They were drafted, they joined and served. 12 million people in uniform, and at some time or other during the war, 16 million people were in the armed forces. Some weren't there at the end because they were dead. Others had been too seriously wounded to stay in the service. And some had come in and gone out. But there were still 12 million all at once in 1945. And almost half of the GDP was devoted to sustaining these fighters and providing them with munitions and equipment of all kinds, training facilities, bases, you name it. So the economy became a huge garrison state uh, by the end of 1945. But that, fortunately, was a, a war that ended, unlike wars now. And now we have wars that never end, because they can't. They can't say when the war on terror is won, so it can't end. Got to go on forever. There'd be a terrorist out there. World War II, thank, thank goodness, had an end. It ended, and the government retrenched very quickly, very quickly. Uh, in fact, part of the reason for the great success of the transition from the military economy of World War II to the post war economy was that so much government power was relinquished. Not without resistance. There were, for example, in 1945, a lot of people who said, we must continue to control prices. During the war, the government had controlled many aspects of the civilian economy, including almost all the prices. So whether you bought groceries or rented an apartment or wanted to get gasoline in your car, whatever it was, the price you paid was either an officially set price or a black market price. And of course, when you had all prices under some kind of government control, you had massive black markets, of course. Whenever the government forbids people from making transactions that they want to make, you get black markets. So you had a lot of black markets in World War II, uh, but most of the transactions that were made were made at the ceiling prices set by the Office of Price Administration. A giant bureaucracy that uh, not only set the prices, but sent hundreds of thousands of people out to monitor what prices were being charged. And they got U.S. attorneys to bring uh, charges against serious violators of the, of the rules. And uh, so it was a, a command economy, is what it was. Not exactly like the one in the Soviet Union, but similar. Fortunately for us, our, ours only lasted a few years, whereas theirs lasted for half a century totally ruined uh, everything inside of the Soviet Union, except, except their military, which got the cream of what resources they had. So there's a big retrenchment after World War II, but there's also a continuation of this upward world of government. And that's how we ultimately get, uh, despite the World War II retrenchment, uh, to our present level of more than 40% government spending relative to GDP. Now, there's another dimension, many dimensions of government 
Oh, one I want to share with you has to do with public indebtedness. And this has become increasingly important. In, in, in U.S. history, uh, the, the federal government especially hardly went into debt at all, except during the time. At that time, it would always go deeply into debt uh, to pay for fighting the war. And then when the war was over, it would begin to pay down that debt. And so you would graph the debt, you see a big increase during the war, and then shortly after that increase, you would see this drop off. And of course, the drop off was much slower than the run up in debt, but nonetheless, eventually the debt would be paid off. So that even after the war between the states, in which a huge amount of money was borrowed, by the time we get up, up to, to World War I, there's virtually no government debt. Almost all been repaid by that time. Just a trivial amount remaining. And then in World War I, there's a huge amount of borrowing. Most of the government spending, all these wars is paid for by borrowing. And then after the war, the government starts to pay it off. But after it's paid off about a third of it, the Great Depression hits, and then the government starts borrowing again because its revenues have fallen so much, while its programs have actually increased, so it's running at deficits in the budget every year. And that's Hoover, too, not just Roosevelt. Hoover runs big deficits. And, and, and so the debt starts up again. It doesn't go up quite the way it did during the wars, but it goes up again and it kind of rises to a high level and increases a little bit year by year. And then World War II comes, and this is the granddaddy of all debt splurges. So by the end, by the end of World War II, the, the federal debt was an amount equal to more than, than the GDP. So if you, if you did this today, if you look around the world and say, who, who does this today? What well, Japan does. <laughs> uh, they're the only ones I can think of right now that have run up the public debt to more than, more than the amount of GDP. But, uh, but they've done it. And you see that puts them in a very precarious situation. And that's why I'm telling you about the way debt is played into the story. Because after World War II, the amount of pay down of debt was trivial. By that time, people had been informed by economists who thought they knew what they were doing. And debt didn't really matter. They used to throw around a slogan. They said, debt's unimportant. We owe it to ourselves. And that was really a stupid thing to say, even if all the debt were internally held. Nowadays, of course, an immense amount of the U.S. debt is held by foreigners. So it's a doubly stupid thing to say now. But even at that time, after World War II, when it was practically all held internally in the United States, the fact that, that it was uh, owed to some Americans didn't mean it, it was not a problem. Because the Americans to whom it was owed were not the same Americans who were obliged to pay it. And a good economist uses methodological individualism. He doesn't get caught up in aggregative tricks where he sweeps everybody together and says, ah, no problem. It is a problem because you and I, everybody else who pays federal taxes, is on the hook to service that great debt the government has run up. After World War II, its debt did not increase very much, and the GDP grew. So debt relative to GDP tended to fall up into the mid-1970s. But after that, uh, the debt began to grow again. President Reagan, another great free marketeer hero, ran up huge peacetime debts for a military buildup. So the debt started up again relative to GDP. It continued through Reagan and Bush won. Under Clinton, it leveled off a bit. It actually came down some relative to GDP. 
But after 2001, this is our most recent great crisis in which government grew in every way you can think of, all at once. Government started to spend more, uh, government started to seize more powers, with things like the USA Patriot Act, and another a number of other provisions like the nationalization of the airport security industry. So the government spending grew much quicker under Bush, and then uh, no sooner was that episode finished than the crisis of 2008 struck, uh, which had a much bigger impact. Then suddenly the government spending grew hugely and started to pass major legislation, not just to spend, but to take over whole industries, giant firms, nationalized virtually the entire uh, lending industry for residential mortgages. Over 90% of the money now being lent for residential mortgages comes from government institutions. Because Fannie and Freddie, uh, these formerly uh, state-sponsored institutions, were simply taken over. And they became nationalized, in fact. So that is the government now. When, when they provide the wherewithal, you know, you go down and borrow from a bank or a savings and loan institution, but they immediately sell your loan to Ben or Freddie, so the loan is coming from Ben or Freddie, not from your bank. It's just an agent, you know, like a peddler of mortgages that gets fees for initiating these loans. The real money comes from the government. And of course, the, the government's now managing that lending in such a way that it's recreating the conditions that brought about the housing bust of 2007 and 8. It's giving money to people who shouldn't be given money to buy a house. They don't really satisfy solid underwriting requirements. For decades, if you wanted to buy a house, you had to put a down payment on a 20% price of the loan you were taking. And that gave a cushion to the lender. Because your house was the collateral that the house value fell, it could fall 20%, they were still okay. They could then seize your, seize your property when you didn't pay them back as scheduled, and they, they would not lose anything. But now there's no cushion for lenders. Then you know, they, they lend practically the full value. In fact, during 2000. Four, five, six, some institutions were lending more than the full value of the house. They were, they were even paying the fees for unqualified buyers. This is how recklessly all that kind of activity was taking place because people had been led to believe that if they got into trouble, they would be bailed out. If you were really on the hook for what you do, you wouldn't be so reckless. That didn't even have a name. Called the Greenspan put, and then after that was the Bernanke put. And what that meant was that, you know, you, you could win if things turned out well, but if things didn't turn out well, you could not lose. Well, what kind of a bet is that? Who wouldn't want a bet like that? Okay. So that's this debt situation. The government has become deeply indebted, and now it's deeply engaged in industries where it never was involved to that scale. It got started during the Great Depression uh, insuring mortgages, but it never got into this later situation that uh, developed during the early part of the century. Uh, right now, the government's debt is, uh, it, it, it is almost 70%, or around 70% of GDP, growing rapidly. Now, some projections actually say it's going to fall a little bit for the next few years. But uh, I don't believe them, nor do I believe the longer term projections, because as far as I can tell, the government's not doing anything seriously to change its mode of operation that will cause the debt to shrink or, or even to grow slowly. And it's going to grow rapidly. Uh, we, we've had under President Obama years and years and years of federal deficits in, in excess of a trillion dollars, which would have been unthinkable at any previous time. And now they've come down, finally, below a trillion dollars, but they're still extraordinarily large by historical standards. So this, uh, this horse is still out of the barn. The government has grown so big in terms of its indebtedness, which means it 
terms of our obligation to service these huge gates. Now, I was going to show you an organization chart for the federal government. Look one up on Google uh, one of these days and just ponder it a little bit. If you've never done that before. You'll, you'll discover that the government has agencies you've never heard of. Uh, in one of my books, I just made a list of, of major federal agencies. It runs for pages and pages and pages. All of this is just one line for each of them. Discovered things like you know, a federal grandparents agency. Uh, I have no idea what it did. Maybe it sends out Christmas cards to orphan grandchildren or something. <laughs> but but uh, the government has got so big that it's not just spending a lot of money for traditional government functions, it's increased the scope of its activities. It increasingly launches into doing things it's never been involved in before. And in a lot of ways, that's more important than just spending more money. Because it means that more and more of the control over decision making in our lives is taken, taken out of our hands and put in the hands of government officials. They tell us what we must do, what we must not do, in areas where it's never any of their damn business. They violate our Constitution routinely. And in some cases, they've been doing this for a long, long time. Okay? For example, our Constitution says that Congress shall make no law uh, impairing the freedom of speech. Okay? But the Food and Drug Administration, for example, has excruciating regulations about what you may say, what you may print when you market a drug or a medical product or anything else they regulate. You know, all know those labels on the side of a pack of cigarettes. They're not there because the manufacturer thought that would be nice. They're there because the FDA demanded, by threatening legal action, that they put those precise messages where they are. Congress shall make no law impairing freedom of speech, except that it's made a law creating an agency that runs riot over people's freedom of speech. And not, not just the FDA, the FTC does this for all kinds of, of manufacturers. What you can say in a marketing message is dictated by a government agency in violation of the Constitution. No law. That's not a hard concept. No law. Okay? How smart do you have to be to understand no law? Well, you have to be smarter than the U.S. Supreme Court. That's for damn sure. They don't get it. They let this happen. They find some way to fancy it up with jurisprudential language. And so that's what the government does. It seizes its power. It interferes in, in, in our lives telling us what to say, what we must not say, what we may say. And it gets bigger and bigger all the time. Uh, it's very difficult to get rid of the government bureaucracy once it's created. Because then you have an iron triangle. You have the people that run it, the people in Congress that use it to feather their nests with contributors, and the beneficiaries who have an interest in keeping it going and pushing it to a bigger level of operation. It's very hard to break through that. All the insiders have a lock on the policy. You'll have trouble if you don't like what they're doing, even getting yourself in line to testify before Congress. So if you study who testifies before Congress, over 90% of the people who testify are there to testify in favor of enlarging the budget. That's the question. You think that's an accident? How many times can you flip a coin and get a hit every time? That's like how many times Congress can schedule people to testify before. They're all in favor of bigger government. Funny how that happens, isn't it? And then the press reports all this, and it gets distributed out to the rest of us out here who don't keep track of these things. Okay. All right, we have these national emergency periods that are especially important for history 
causing the government to grow. And they, when they do that, they not only create iron triangles that they're trying to get rid of, but probably more important than that, they create, they create ideological changes. Think about World War II, for example. It was especially important in this regard. In World War II, the government controlled people in a way they never controlled them before or since for that matter, in many respects. So there's, a, there's an overbearing government. Everything that's done is justified as a war measure. And of course, everybody in the country, almost without exception, wants to win the war. They don't want to win it so much that they want to sell and buy on the black market. That's true. Uh, but nonetheless, in some sense, everybody's in favor of this war. And they, 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 want to, they want to not stand in the way of the government that purports to be trying to win it. So you get this overriding excuse that's a beauty. You can't really argue about what the government's doing. The government's trying to control this, that, and everything. So people get, get accustomed. That's, that's the reason these things work. Say, why do people change their beliefs? Why do, they, why do they alter their views of what the proper scope of government should be? Is it because they read a book and it tells them, you know, it would be a great idea if government did X, Y, and Z, but it hasn't done that before? Well, occasionally. They may change your views like that. Now, intellectuals may have a little influence here. People who write books, who talk on TV. But for the most part, we, we change our ideologies because of experience and the way that we understand that experience. Now, intellectuals come into the picture here because they're helping to interpret everything that's happening. And they're telling us, look, this is being done for this reason. We don't have a better idea. We tend to accept what we're being told. But here's, here's the drift of this command and conduct experience. It goes on for years on end, and people get accustomed to the fact that they can't charge the prices they want for what they sell. They can't work just where they prefer to work. They can't say what they'd like to say. Bad, yeah, but they get used to it. And afterwards, having had that experience, they're just not as much in love with their rights as they used to be. They don't immediately recoil when somebody says, well, the government should do this, because it did it during the war. Look, we lived, we lived through that. We survived that experience. We, we've had that. And that's not so bad. In fact, the people who propose these new government programs or controls will market them that way. They'll often say, as, as Hoover said in 1930, we did such and such during the war, we can do it again to fight the Depression. Terrible analogy, but not uncommon. We did something before, so we can do it again. Especially if you've told a story to the effect that when you did it before, it worked. And that's the story that tended to be told after both the world wars. We had a command economy, less so in World War I, but to a substantial degree, even then. And we had a big economy in World War II, a command economy. We won those wars. At least we were on the winning side. And uh, so they, they worked. They worked in wartime. Why, why won't they work in peacetime? Some people will even go on and say, it ought to be easier to do this in peacetime than it was during war. So you can sell people things, you can make them believe things, because they've had an experience that is congruent with your claim. And that's happened to Americans in the 20th century. If you were to go back to our ancestors of 100 years ago, try to impose on them all of the regulations and taxes and controls that we have today, they would rebel against them. They wouldn't stand for it. They would fight. They would take to the streets if you tried to dump all that on them all at once. But that's not how it happened. I said it was a long historical process with a lot of different things happening, a lot of different actors. If you do it like that, you can end up 
where you would never end up if you tried to do it in a single step. So that's how we basically got to this big government. I have another display I wanted to show you about the growth of federal outlays uh, since World War II. Uh, except for the economic crisis since 2008, we haven't had any similarly great crises comparable to the World Wars uh, since World War II. Uh, we certainly had a period of about 10 years from, from, from roughly 1964 to 70, in, in which all hell broke had a lot of similarities to, to some of the previous crises, but uh, they were still not quite as severe as, as the world wars in, in its effects. But by the time we get through that period, and we get, say, to the mid-1970s, we have had so much growth in the size, scope, and power of government from all the previous crises that have ratcheted up uh, since the beginning of the 20th century that, that at that point, big government has become institutionalized. It's become embedded in bureaus, in people's thinking. It's been embedded in the way things are done. If, if, if you want to uh, put up a structure now, nobody is startled to be told they got to they gotta satisfy the environmental regulations. Well, you know, there were no environmental regulations on construction projects before the 1970s. Uh, but there's a whole bunch of things like that that are just routine now. We just accept them because that's what you have to accept. You get anything done. You got to get permission from government bureaucrats. Uh, people didn't need to get it in the beginning. This is not a matter of Republicans and Democrats. What my chart shows here is that every single presidency since World War II has involved a higher <clears throat> level of federal spending in real terms than the preceding one on average. So whether it's a Democrat or Republican, the growth of government just marches inexorably upward. And right now it's at an all-time high, uh, even adjusted for inflation uh, and adjusted for the growth of the population, uh, federal spending is now greater than it was during World War II. Saying so. And it's going to continue growing. It's already built into the system. If you look at the projections that are made by, by uh, the Office of Management and Budget or the projections that are made by the Congressional Budget Office, you see the projections of continued uh, government spending. There has been a change in the nature of the government spending, especially since the 1960s. And that is a change. Uh, away from government purchasing goods and services and toward government just giving people money for nothing, which is to say there's no quid pro quo. When the Pentagon buys an airplane from Lockheed Martin, that's a sale. Okay? The government gets an airplane, Lockheed Martin gets a quadrillion bucks. Okay? But when, when, when Grandma gets her Social Security chip, that's a transfer. Grandma doesn't give anything back to, to the government in exchange for that, that money that she's receiving. So transfer payments have become a bigger and bigger part of all federal spending, and now uh, they're the lion's share of it, and it's continuing to increase. And the projections are that uh, in another couple of decades, uh, <laughs> the government's discretionary spending for purchasing goods and services of all kinds at the federal level will almost be squeezed down relatively to almost nothing unless taxes are raised substantially because uh, what happened is that in 1965 the government creates something called Medicaid. And it already created Social Security in 1935. And it wasn't a big deal until the 60s actually because a lot of people weren't covered by it. The payments were pretty small. But the politicians discovered win votes by promising people that they would raise Social Security benefits in the 50s and 60s. Every election, they'd go out and say, vote for me, I'll pay you more Social Security. So they did that, they purchased the votes, they ran up Social Security uh, benefit values to 
much higher levels than they had been before. But that was nothing compared to Medicare. Medicare promised that medical insurance for everybody over 65 years of age. It didn't matter, you didn't have to qualify by low income range. If you were 65 years old, you qualified. And it was a very highly subsidized medical insurance. So now all these old people who are going to become a much bigger share of the population as the baby boom generation is now retiring. They've already hit 65, the oldest of them. And some huge numbers of them will be turning 65 every year for the next uh, 15, 18 years. They're going to ensure that more and more people are demanding the best medical care they can get. One thing about us geezers, you know, we want the best. And we want you to pay for it, young folks. You have to because if we can't, we're retired. We'd like to pay our own bills, but I'm sorry. The government promised to take care of us in 1965, and now the chickens have come home to roost. And this chart I was going to show you shows this line galloping upward total government transfer payments to individuals now up to about two and a half trillion dollars a year and that's about one-sixth of the entire GDP and getting bigger all the time now if you do that if you do the arithmetic of this what you discover very easily is that this can't go on not only can it not go on forever it can't even go on much longer. <laughs> because in another 20 years, Medicare alone will be more than the whole federal government can pay. Well, that can't happen. Lockheed Martin can settle for that. So, something else has to happen. What can't happen, won't happen. So, the, the geezers are going to have to be gradually squeezed out in one way or another. They're going to have to pay bigger co-payments, they're going to have to pay bigger premiums, they're going, to, they're going to find that they're not eligible for certain procedures, blah, blah, blah. There'll be all these little ways in which the government can retrench on its promises without standing up and looking in the face and saying, I'm sorry, we promised you the impossible, we can't do it. They'll pretend they're still maintaining the Medicare system, but they'll have to chip away at it and chip away at it and chip away at it they don't have the wherewithal to do anything else. Because that's not the only one. Medicare is not the only child in this family. Tons of other transfer payments are being made as well. It's not as big, not as serious as this one because old people have very disproportionate demand for health care. A big share of all health care is incurred by people in the final year of life. The people were just do the courteous thing and die a year sooner, and this problem could be almost eliminated. <laughs> no, it's bad logic. <laughs> but it's still here last year. <laughs> but at all events, that's how it works. Lots of old people, huge medical expenses, giant drain on the treasury. This was something that we got into during the period of hell was breaking loose under President Johnson. They got institutionalized. If you try to get rid of Medicare, every geezer in America would vote against you, guarantee it, well, except for me. But uh, what difference would that make? At all events, that's, a, that's a, a picture of a story. That's why I've drawn the line so long here uh, to make up for the library pictures. But I hope you get some of the highlights of how we got into this situation. I hope, too, you can be here tonight with an appreciation serious it is, because this is a big deal. This is a big deal. People talk a lot about social and economic problems, but there's hardly one of them that is as important as the growth of development.